Going on to verse 7, it says, Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Fear the Lord. What is that talking about? We don't like to talk about fear today. Well, fear means a lot of different things too, but in this case, it means reverence him, pay attention to him, honor him, respect him. He is God. He's the creator of the universe. He's my creator. And so there is room for fear. He is the one we're to fear, God. And the fear we have from him and for him and of him is because his thoughts are way higher than ours and yet he loves us so dearly. So we're to reference him. And how do we reference him? We reverence him by not doing evil, by refraining from evil. This verse says, depart from evil. Stay away from it. So good advice, wise counsel coming from God. In this case, Solomon probably talking to his son, but it's God talking to Mike is God talking to you through the Holy Spirit. Verse 8. Now, verse 8, it says that's a promise that we get. So, verse 7, if we do verse 7, which says, Be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord, and depart from evil. The promise is, verse 8 says, It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Health-wise, we are better off by following the instructions of the Bible. We're healthy. You know, a lot of a lot of sicknesses and the scientists and, and doctors today are coming up with this and discovering it and acknowledging it. A lot of our physical health problems have to do with our attitude in life. And so if we heed this wise counsel that's in the third chapter of Proverbs, our, our physical bodies will be healthier. And it's not just superficial. When it talks about the marrow of the bones, that's the essence of what we're made of. That's our skeletal structure. So what it's referring to is that our system, navel, and our bones, our bodies, complete bodies, will be healthier by heeding this wise counsel that he's given to us verse 9 kind of hits close to home a lot of times it says honor the lord with thy substance honor the lord with thy substance you know the bible emphasizes 10 percent, particularly in the old testament in the new testament fulfills the old testament and uh, people struggle and sometimes get beat down because they got they got to give that 10% to the Lord. Well, first of all, he wants a cheerful giver. But that 10%, when you think about the essence of what this wise counsel is, is only 10% of what we should honor the Lord by. That's a start, isn't it? It says, honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase the priority is god <clears throat> now the way i read this is it doesn't say honor the lord with 10 percent of your substance it just says thy substance so everything we have belongs to god and that's where we start everything we have now does that mean i can't buy groceries no God wants you to eat. Does it mean you can't clothe yourself? No, God wants you to clothe yourself. In the day in which we live, we need clothes. We need shelter. We need food. But don't spend a dime without first considering what God desires and directs. We are to honor the Lord with everything that he has provided for us, which is everything that we have. And the priority, this says the first fruits, the best, The priority is God and his direction in our life. Remember, back up up in the uh, earlier verses, we're to trust in the Lord with all our heart. We're not to lean to our own understanding. And it says, if we trust in him, acknowledge in him in every way, he'll direct our path. That's the same application that goes with these verses down here about substance. We think of money, and that's certainly part of it, is money. But it's everything that he's blessed us with. 
our, all of our possessions belong to him. He's loaned it to us, and we're to be good stewards. Now, does that mean we're supposed to, that we can justify just not doing anything in the church and stuff like that? No. Don't you think God knows where your money needs to go? And that's all it says is let him direct our path, Mike, and yours. What is the promise for doing that? Verse 10 says, By doing that, your barns will be filled with plenty, and your presses shall burst out with new wine. Now that was Solomon talking to his son more than likely. So what does that tell us? And it, it's the tenth verse, and it, it basically is saying uh, by keeping verse 9, then the promise is my available provisions, the barn, what I have to draw from, will be all that I need. It will be what I need, and it will be quality. It won't just be leftover stuff. It'll be quality. And the quality comes from the reference to new wine. New wine is pure, not fermented. The fermentation begins to make it older wine. And I don't want to labor over that, but uh, in, in this, this reference, it says if our lives are pure, is not fermented, and then that's the kind of quality we'll have to the to the possessions that God gives us, and it's conditioned upon our acknowledging, honoring Him with all of our substance and and anything that we gain. He's first. So what a great promise that our barns will be filled with plenty, and it will be good stuff. The uh, verse 11 says, My son, now this, this is pretty hard teachings that, that really does fly in the face with a lot of modern psycholo uh, psychological thought and teachings in education. So it says, My son, desp despise not the chastening of the Lord. You know, so many ways today, and I think it has been... Uh, unwittingly we teach children to believe that anybody who disciplines them doesn't like them he hates me well God disciplines us he chastises us there's another thing people are really hesitant to use the word punishment nowadays oh we're not going to punish anybody no we're going to show him them the right way well, correction sometimes requires punishment, and punishment, for punishment's sake, is not good. But if it's a reasonable punishment that is intended to correct, that's healthy, and that's what we do. That, now, this is not about what we're doing to others. This is about what God does to us as his own. And it says for us not to despise it. Don't think that God doesn't love you because he's chastening you. No, Mike, if he's chastening you, and he does, and I can attest to that, it's because he loves me. So don't get weary. Don't, don't get discouraged because he's chastening us because as long as he's chastening us, we know he loves us. And we are growing in Christ because he's correcting things in our lives. And verse 12 follows that. says, For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth. If we correct, well, if we love our children, we're going to correct them because we want them to do right. I believe that that's a clear uh, connection with the fact that the Lord loves us and because he loves us, he corrects us. And he, it, it makes the connection because in the last part of that verse, it says, even as a father, the son in whom it, he delighteth. We can love our children. We can be so proud of our children. But in so being, we're going to correct them because we love them. We don't want them to keep going down the wrong path. That's the way God does us, and he's our example. 
And it says, Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. If we live in an awareness of these lessons that are in this chapter, we will experience happiness from and of the Lord. That is much better than any happiness the world might afford us. God's happiness brings understanding. It's not necessarily mysterious. By being happy in the Lord, we can understand much better His ways. And God's happiness is better than silver and gold, anything that this world offers today. The merchandise of it is better than merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. And that's verse 14. There's nothing in this world that is better than or even com uh, comparable to what God can provide in the way of happiness, in the way of joy and contentment. Happiness, as a word, kind of falls short there. But all the, the qualities of our feelings that God can give us, there's nothing in the world to compare with that. All of these teachings in verse 3 have to do with wise counsel or wisdom. Wisdom is often in the Bible referred to as a lady. And in verse 15, it reads this way, She is more precious than rubies wisdom of God is more precious than rubies. Wisdom of God is more precious than valued jewelry, valued substances, treasured things. God's wisdom is more precious than those. And all the things that you can't desire are not to be compared to God's wisdom. There's nothing in this world, there's nothing that you could desire that is better than or that could even be compared with the wisdom that comes from God. And in these verses, he has shared that wisdom with us. It is a very important lesson for me and I believe for anybody who listens it's right out of the Bible, and if you had any questions or have any questions about my comments, just read the Bible and just take, the, take what God says. My reference is how I believe the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and I believe it's true, obviously. But uh, when, we, when you get discouraged or you get down or you feel like God's picking on you, Read the third chapter of Proverbs, and these first 15 verses are just wonderful to lift your spirits. And in the world today in which we live, when there's so many things that are just evil, uh, things that we couldn't have imagined about even 10 or 15 years ago, and those of you who are close to my age, the world in which we were raised is nothing like the world today, and it's not better today in regard to morals, in regard to standards and godliness. Uh, in some ways, uh, we've had a lot of advancements. But in those qualities of life that God values, I'm afraid that we've fallen uh, way short of being what he would have us to be. But as believers in Christ and followers of Christ, we don't have to be discouraged because he is our hope. And he's a certain hope. When we're disappointed with our leaders, whether it's locally or statewide or nationally, uh, and the world is uh, is in a mess, we need to be remember. We need to remember and be reminded that our trust is in the Lord. It's not in our own selves or in our own understanding. It's not in men. Is certainly not in the world. We can be happy in the sense of being happy in the Lord. Not happy with the evil of this world, but happiness that comes from God, a joy and contentment and a peace, peace of God, peace with God, 
we can be victorious even as we're going through the trials and the temptations and the discouragement that we can see and experience in this world, we can rise above that and be victorious in Jesus. He paid the price for the victory that he has and will is to come to pass in fruition. We wait for the time when Jesus comes back for us. The We're celebrating Christmas now, the birth, the virgin birth of Jesus when he came to earth as our Savior. But we look forward to the imminent return of Christ coming back as the true King of kings and the Lord of lords to demonstrate he is full and complete victory over evil and death. We have everlasting life as a gift that has been given to us. We can live the quality of life that God desires from us by heeding his wisdom, which is shared to us in his word and particularly in the third chapter of Proverbs.
thank you so much for joining me. It's been fun. It's been good. It's been encouraging to me. And I hope you've got some of that also. God bless.